Hi, we're back on the Studio Light project and this package has just come through the post. So let's take a look inside. It's from PCB Way and this should be our aluminium PCBs. If you recall from the other video, I had these FR4 PCBs made, but there was a bit of a thermal limitation uh, when powering these LEDs all the way up to 60 watts. So we've had some aluminium boards made. We'll have a closer look at those in a moment. And also we have a stencil. So let's have a look at the design and then we'll have a quick look on the PCB website at the specifications of the board. So here is the new design in Altium Designer and I'll put a link in the description down below if you want to get hold of a free trial for this. Um, there's just a few changes since last time. So here's the previous revision of the board which you're probably familiar with. On the new version what we've done is first of all I've beefed up some of the tracers. Uh, I neglected to do that previously and actually with 4.8 amps going through these tracers we were wasting a bit of power in these so those have been beefed up. Obviously I've removed the bottom side of the PCB because the aluminium board is a single sided board. Then I've added these two cutouts here and previously on the standard two layer board I could have these connectors on the back of the PCB and then have the wires going through to the back. With the single sided board Basically there's a solder pad here and a solder pad here on the front side of the board and then the wire is going to run through this hole here. For the temperature sensor I've replaced the through hole part with a pico blade connector and then again that's going to run through here. Now you'll also see we've got quite a few more holes in this design than previously and I thought it might be useful to add some ventilation holes basically so that's what these holes are all the way around the outside just in case any airflow wants to make its way through from where the fan's blowing because I noticed the front side of the board was actually quite a bit warmer than the other side. I noticed this also with the aquarium light. And then the other change, I've added a couple of extra holes here and what we're going to try and do is attach the heat sink directly to the PCB. So some thermal grease and then actually just put some M3 screws through into some tapped holes on the aluminium heat sink and I think that might give us better results overall. So these PCBs came from PCBWay who have some excellent options for various different types of PCB. In this case we wanted to order aluminium boards so I've uploaded the Gerber file and you can see that automatically shows what those are going to look like. In this case we wanted aluminium and I increased the thermal conductivity from 1 to 2. There is a slight cost increase as a result of that but that increases the thermal conductivity allowing more heat to be conducted through to the aluminium plate on this board. Now I also opted for a slightly thicker board um, since we may as well have the aluminium dissipating a little bit of power. Uh, it should work slightly better as a heat spreader as well onto that heat sink. And then one nice thing is, which I don't think they had before, but you can pick all of the colour options for aluminium boards now. So I selected the matte black option so that it's hidden in the light and then just the white silk screen. And I think that's about the only thing I changed. There are obviously the various surface finishes. But what we should find is that with these aluminium PCBs with the higher thermal conductivity we should have much better cooling of the LEDs and we're going to do a comparison between the two with the sensor that's actually on the PCB. They've got quite a few help pages on the PCB website. This is the one about aluminium PCBs and it tells you a little bit about how it's made. What I'm assuming happens when you select that different option for the thermal conductivity is that they're using a different dielectric layer here between the copper and the aluminium board. It doesn't make sense for these two to be changed in any way. So this must be a more expensive thermally conductive dielectric layer. It took around a week for these to arrive after ordering them. So that's pretty good. Let's have a look and see what the boards actually look like. So I've just been through all of the boards. Sadly they do all have some scuff marks on the solder mask as you can see. It looks like this has happened later on in the production process. From what I can tell the holes have been drilled after all of the other processes. So you can see the finish where it's been routed along is really nice. Absolutely no problems there whatsoever. But the drill holes are actually a little bit rough. You can see on this one uh, yeah, like there's there's some unfinished drill holes through this aluminium. It's like it's been drilled either too quickly or with a slightly blunt drill bit. And I'm going to have to deburr all of these before I apply the heat sink because they actually protrude a little bit from the back of the aluminium board. 
So yeah, here's a slightly closer view. You can see the hole is somewhat unfinished at the bottom here. It's not quite drilled through properly. The solder mask is absolutely perfectly aligned with the pads. You can see all of that looks perfect, exactly as designed in our team. It's a shame that this has let down um, the PCB slightly, but it's not too much of a big issue. Now, if you've ever ordered a stencil from PCBWay, you'll know how easy it is to accidentally select the option where you have a full-size stencil and the frame as well. And obviously that increases the postage cost as well. So this time when I placed the order, I left a comment in the order notes box before checking the order out to ask if they could cut down the stencil to the same size as the PCB. So it looks like they have actually done that this time. And what this means is I can just line up the edges, hopefully. Yeah, line up the edges and all of the pads are in the right place. So that for something like this where, uh, you know, I'm only assembling a few simple boards, this will make the assembly a lot easier without having to faff around with that huge stencil. So it looks like my deburring tool is a little bit too chunky to be able to fit into these holes. So I'm just going to run a slightly bigger drill bit on the back side of the PCB, just on all of these holes to clean these up a little bit and then we'll apply the solder paste. That's the PCB tidied up a little bit, so next let's put the solder paste on and solder up the components. So that's now ready to reflow, and for those of you wondering, the tool that I use to place the parts is a little tool that I made. It uses the Weller WVP handpiece, but it's a little vacuum pump that I made and I'll put a link to the project in the description down below because I often get requests from those who haven't seen that video about this little tool that I use to pick and place components manually onto PCBs. So that's the PCB reflowed. For the solder paste, I just use the Solder King no clean, lead-free, low temperature bismuth solder paste, which I have really good results with. Despite the fact that it's very close to expiry, it's getting on for nearly a year old, it still seems to give really good results, so I'm pretty happy with how that's turned out. Next up, we're gonna try and solder some wires onto these pads for the LEDs. Uh, what we're gonna need to do, I think, is melt some additional solder onto the pad first, and while keeping it hot, then dip the wire into it. Now I've pre-tinned these little fly leads and we're going to try using the new Metcal GT120 station to uh, heat up these pads. Now it's going to be a little bit of a challenge because we are on an aluminium PCB but it does look like it's melted that quite nicely. Yeah that's worked no problem despite the quite large amount of aluminium which we've got here. That's the PCB pretty much ready to go. Now I have prepared another heat sink. This time we've got some holes drilled in it and they've been tapped with some M3 threads, which means that we should be able to attach this directly to the heat sink, eliminating that thermal tape. And if I've designed this correctly, the screw holes should sit in a void inside the lenses that need to go over here. I'm probably gonna use some plastic screws and I'm obviously gonna add some thermal paste between the heat sink and the PCB. So I've managed to attach the heat sink to the PCB. You can see we've got a bit of thermal goop just oozing out there. But as you can see on the back of the lenses, there's a little bit of a void there. And that is exactly where we've got these screws. And the position of those screws means that we should get really good contact where it actually matters by the LED. But this aluminium PCB should spread the heat out much better than the FR4 design that we've previously used. So what I want to do now is on each of these PCBs, I put a microchip TC1047A temperature sensor and I want to run this at various currents and then measure the temperature using that sensor. And I want to do a side-by-side -side comparison of the FR4 board and the metal clad PCB and see how they behave. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it at a series of drive currents because when we did the microscope light at the currents that I was driving at, I didn't really notice any difference in the thermal dissipation between the FR4 PCB and the metal clad PCB. But now we're driving significantly more power in 60 watts. We seem to have reached some limitations somewhere with this original design that used an FR4 board. So I'm going to run it at a series of currents and what we might see is that the much higher currents 
uh, we see much better thermal conductivity through this design. But it's not tested yet, so that's only what I'm hoping. And to support this, uh, one of my subscribers actually sent me a piece of hardware. So this is the Magic DAC. And I'm going to use this as a data logger to measure the voltage from these two temperature sensors. Then we can plot them against time, see what the waveform looks like at the various different drive currents. Now, he does have a website, um, so Magic DAC. And basically, this is his product, uh, an alternative to the standard National Instruments Types USB DACs. And he sent me this kit. We will do a review of this product in a future video. Uh, but for this, I, it was a really handy piece of equipment to try and do this testing with. Um, but I'll put a link to this down below if you want to take a look. As I said, I will do a dedicated video on this in the future. We're about ready to start the testing. And I've got the studio light set up exactly as I plan to have it in the final incarnation. So we've got the LED board at the front as we did before. Then the heatsink attached to it. We've got the baffle that then holds the fan and the airflow is going to come out through the vents at the side here. And then what we're going to do is run that fan at full speed. So 24 volts into the fan because we did notice when we tested with the FR4 board at high powers last time we were definitely saturating somewhere. So we really do need that full speed into the fan and that fan speed is going to be the same for every test so that that is consistent across every test. Now I've got the TC147A temperature sensor hooked up to the Magic DAC. Fortunately, I used the TC147A rather than the, just the standard TC147 because that has a 5 volt uh, input voltage. So what I'm able to do is just run the temperature sensor directly from the Magic DAC. So we've got the 5 volts going in, we've got the analog input, and then we've also got the ground pin being used for the other terminal. Now, depends what you're using it for, but one thing that I think that would be really handy on this device is also a 3.3 volt regulated output and also a 2.5 volt regulated output because a lot of sensors run on those voltages. It does have a couple of analog outputs, but obviously in your code, uh, because this runs Python uh, on the PC, you could accidentally set these voltages to something ridiculous and blow up your equipment. And also, um, I don't know what the behavior is of these on startup. It, there is possibly the chance that when you first run your Python script until it gets to that point, they're doing some arbitrary output voltage that could ruin your electronics. Uh, obviously, if you're doing data logging in a system where you've already got power and everything, then you wouldn't need that. But as a nice addition, it would be quite interesting to have that 3.3 and 2.5 volt output on here. So I think I'm going to get ready to run these tests. It might take a while. I'm going to do everything. And that's my cat saying it's time for strokes. Uh, we're going to try and run this test. Um, it might take a while, but I'll come back to you. I'm going to try and keep everything consistent. Uh, it is quite a warm day, but it's just starting to cool off now. Uh, I don't think a couple of degrees will matter too much. So we'll take a look at the graphs in a moment, but you can see we had a little bit of a problem here on the FR4 board. Things got a little bit toasty at the extremely high currents, and the LED started to slide off the pads. I guess that's one downside to using low temperature solder, although that still means that the temperature on the LED die itself exceeded 150 degrees C, so these were about to die probably anyway. So here is the data, and for the FR4 PCB we've got the dashed lines, and for the Metal Cloud PCB it's the solid lines, and the colours are the same for the same drive current. So you can see at the very low currents, 350 milliamps, there's basically no difference between the two PCBs. It just elevates very slightly from ambient. At 700 milliamps, again, very, very close, about one degree between the two. And then as we start to increase a bit further, the difference starts to increase. So we're getting a couple of degrees difference here at 1 amp, and then even more at 1.5 amps. Uh, we're talking about 5 degrees difference at 2.4 amps, and then all of a sudden at 3.6 amps, the difference is quite extreme. We're probably seeing at least um, 15 degrees C difference. But also bear in mind that the temperature sensor is monitoring the temperature of the PCB. So actually the metal clad PCB is going to have a more accurate reading. As we've seen, the LEDs managed to desolder themselves. So although the PCB was at around 60 degrees C on the FR4 board, the LEDs are obviously way higher than that. And then at 4.8 amps with the aluminium PCB, we're still below the temperature that we were seeing for the FR4 board. 
Now, I've got some thermal images of the Metal Cloud PCB, and we can see that the Metal Cloud PCB was doing a really good job of dissipating the power from the LED. So these are at the end of the testing, basically at 4.8 amps, we've got the lens on one of the LEDs, and then I just removed the lens off the other one, and you can see we're getting somewhere about 77, uh, 76 degrees C actually on the LED itself. And you can see the PCB temperature about 58 degrees, which is what we were measuring. So actually, these LEDs are much happier on this metal clad PCB. And what we should remember is that a lot of these specifications are at 85 degrees C die temperature. So we're well within that. That means we should be getting the CRI of 90 plus that we're expecting from these and also the colour temperature that we're expecting. So these ha LEDs will happily run at that temperature for extended periods of time. And so here it shows in the data sheet, if you're able to keep the junction at 25 degrees C, which you might be able to using a tech or some other cooler, then you can actually get more light output than is specified in the data sheet. Up at 85 is where it's just crossing through that 100% threshold. So that's where we've got our data sheet figures. We're sitting somewhere around 75 degrees C and it was quite stable at that point. So we should expect just a little bit more light than what we're actually quoted in this data sheet. And with the maximum LED junction temperature being 150 degrees C, we must have been right at the point where the LED was about to fail, where the FR4 board started to overheat. So some really useful information there, and probably a little bit more in line with what people would have expected. Uh, the result when I did the microscope LEDs was potentially a bit of a surprise to some people, but that was because I was running these LEDs at the lower currents and we didn't see a huge difference between these two designs at one amp, which was the maximum that I tested with. Also, when I placed the order for this design, as you can see, I completely forgot to select the thinner PCBs. I meant to select the 0.6 millimeter PCB. I've just gone for the standard 1.6 here, which means that we've got more distance for the heat to travel from the LED through to the heat sink. Now, also, Another thing to bear in mind is that these aluminium PCBs are really good because they essentially act like a heat spreader. So although we've got contact with the heat sink directly behind these LEDs, we're also using the quite thick aluminium board as a heat spreader to help with the dissipation and provide better conductivity through to the heat sink. On this design, the FR4 PCB is not actually doing that much in terms of helping to dissipate the heat, all it's doing is conducting the heat directly behind the LED into a small square behind where the LED sits. And with a design like this, we could have, for example, a bit of warpage of the PCB. The heat sink might not be completely flat, and therefore we may have a bit of a void directly behind where the LEDs sit. A better design would be to reduce the thickness of the PCB and then have a custom designed heat sink that has a square that sits exactly behind the LED and only in that sort of 50, what is it, 70 millimeter area underneath the heat sink and not any of the rest of the board. We don't care about cooling the rest of the PCB. But you can see here, these aluminium boards just get rid of all that problem and you've got a lot more freedom to operate with your thermal design for these high power LEDs. So hope some of you found that useful. Don't forget to visit PCB Way if you are thinking about getting uh, a high power PCB made. They do also do copper PCBs, but they are a little bit more expensive. But if you're really pushing the limits of the thermal conductivity of the aluminium PCB, you might want to consider those copper PCBs that you can have made there. So I'll put a link to PCB Way in the description down below. Also a link to Sean's Magic DAC, which has been really useful for this test. And the results, in this case, I was able to just plot out uh, on Excel. Sean helped me with some Python to get this going so I could just log the data. So also a big thank you to him. So if you've got any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. When we visit this project next, it will either be to talk about the 3D printing from PCB Way, or we'll be uh, going through the design of the PCB that's going to go at the back to drive these LEDs. So a big thank you to all my Patreon supporters, and until next time, thanks for watching.